All right, it is day one of our weight loss challenge. And before we begin, I just wanna show you how to kind of navigate the membership because there's a lot that you've been access been given access to um, if you officially join the challenge. And I want you to understand how to access all of it. So you'll first just go to plantwise.com and hit login. Or if you downloaded the Kajabi apps, um, which you see this little up here, these are the Kajabi apps, um, then you can go directly from the apps to um, like to the community and to the membership. But if you don't have it, I'm just going to show you the good old fashioned way how to log in on your on your phone. Um, and if you are not already part of the membership, here is the link of how you can join um, during this during this challenge. So you'll go into login. So let me hurry and put that link in the chat real quick. Perfect. Okay, so you'll go to login and you'll you'll enter your info. If you don't have your info, you can easily put forgot password, you know, and it will send it to you. Um, so let me just get mine in there. It should automatically pop up. And then you'll see everything you have access to. Now, for most of you, it's usually four products. For me, because um, I have access to everything, <laughs> you'll see all of our meal guides and previous courses, uh, current courses, everything in here right now. Uh, so here's the membership. So this is where the recordings to this challenge, if you for any reason can't join any of the days, this is where I will upload the recording and you'll see it right here. So this was to our June challenge. And then I'm going to upload July's challenge as about an hour after the class ends. So you'll be able to see them each time I go through it. I tweak things. I make them a little bit different. So it's, you know, you're welcome to watch the old challenges, but you'll always want to join live if possible. And then um, you also will see that you have access to a bunch of stuff right here. Uh, the you know tips to ease into plant-based cooking, um, how to cook without oil, right? Uh, our free gift, the no recipe cookbook, and all of these edible meal planning sh shopping lists, um, our gains and goals weekly worksheet, all of those things are available to you. With our bonus uh, previous challenge we've done before, if you're really looking to gain more muscle, uh, then we have this fit with fiber nutrition class where we dive, dive deep into protein, which I won't talk about as much right now, but this one dives deep into protein, uh, as well as some beginner Pilates classes as a bonus. But then after that, you may only have access to month one, or if you've been in my program for a while now, you'll have access to you know month two, month three, month four. Uh, each month opens up new uh, master classes, so you can watch the like month two, for example, is how to minimize your risk of heart disease. And it's a whole class on that. And then you also have all of these cooking demonstrations with recipes. So if you're looking for recipes, this is where it's at, uh, you know, how to make plant-based queso, uh, which someone just told me that they tried and it was delicious. So any of these things will be available and each month opens up more of these master classes and cooking demonstrations. Now that's the one aspect of it. The second aspect of the membership, after we finish with this, um, with this call tomorrow, we'll talk about what I want you to be doing inside the community. The community is very similar to a Facebook group that's not on Facebook. So that's where you can ask any type of questions. You would log in here. Um, I actually already have it open which might be a little easier, but you'll log in and you'll write down, which we'll talk about tomorrow, your gains and goals. Um, and you'll be able to write down any questions, share recipes. This is where the community makes a big difference. Uh, we have our group coaching calls in here. Usually they're not on Zoom. They're actually uh, recorded all within this app just to make it simple and easy. And that way you can watch all of the previous recordings. So while you have access to the membership to, you know, these three days are not the only days that you can watch classes. You can watch Pilates classes, but you can also watch our, our former group coaching classes, our mindset calls. There's a lot of uh, things you have available in here. If you enjoy Pilates as much as I do, you'll love that there's a ton of classes here. Um, but I know you didn't join for the exercise, you joined for the knowledge. And there's tons of, of uh, like our emotional eating group call or a lot of other information in there. And then each of these like circles is where you'll chat. You can share recipes. You can ask questions. It's again, our Facebook group that's not inside Facebook. So you don't log in and get distracted by 
all of the things that usually um, I get distracted with when I'm on social media. So you can just go right in and focus, ask a question and pop right out um, and give some support for others going through it at the same time. So after that, this week, you will have um, the next thing is to do the emotional eating reset. This is a two week program. This is phase two of your weight loss journey. I can't make a lot of changes in just three days. And so this emotional eating reset, even if you don't want to follow the specific meal plan, it is life-changing. Um, it will help you. I'll go through the products. So you can see it. It, it each day. You'll listen to a video where we really dive deep into why it is that you're eating when you're not hungry, whether it's because you're bored, whether it's because you're stressed, um, overwhelmed, or you feel like you need a reward at the end of a really long day. This to me is worth all of it. You know, even if you're just in this program for a month, do this challenge, um, spend the time to listen to the call every single day to that recording every single day and do the quiz after. And it's 14 days long. Um, again, you follow a specific meal plan, but even if you don't want to follow the meal plan, you still want to listen to those videos to help you overcome emotional eating. This is where a lot of our clients lose a lot of weight when they do follow the specific meal plan. It's super simple. I'm all about simplicity. I'm all about keeping it easy. And so you'll be able to read exactly what that is by logging in and clicking on that. And then lastly, before we start the call officially, um, is the healthy living lifestyle challenge. And that is phase three. And so you'll, if you're interested in joining that, you'll want to start at the beginning of the month. And so right now I'm currently doing a challenge with the July people and then whoever wants to continue on or start it in August, we'll start that before August 1st. And that is super simple. We just basically challenge you to follow all of the things you already know, like drinking enough water, eating enough fruits and vegetables, eating the five a day, right? Getting enough sleep at night, just these very basic things, but it, it challenges you to follow through with them. So that is what's inside of um, the membership. So just so that you guys can kind of see what it is that you have access to if you have already, um, if you've already paid for the membership. If for any reason you haven't, I'm just going to show this, click, click this link in again. Um, if you want to do the emotional eating challenge and you haven't already signed up, then you can, you can, um, join with that link. So in the meantime, let me, uh, hit that slideshow. There we go. There's the chat. Here's the, here's the link just in case again, you haven't gotten it. Okay. All right. So first day, um, I love, 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 love teaching these principles. They're basic. They're simple. Um, my goal in life is to show you how easy this can be, how fun this can be and how delicious it can be to reach your weight loss goals. Uh, for some people, it may just be a couple of pounds for others. It may be more than a hundred pounds. And I want all of you to know that you're welcome here. And I'm excited for you to understand a little bit deeper on why we follow the process that we follow and why we want to really uh, focus on eating more plants. You are here because you most likely felt inspired to make a change, maybe because you are overweight, maybe because you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, maybe you have joint pain, you might have digestive problems or struggle with heart disease, diabetes, fatty liver, cancer, have memory problems or poor body image, possibly struggle with depression, anxiety, loneliness, and lower self-esteem. I want you to know that I can get you from there to here. I can get you at your optimal body size for your stage of life. I can get you to lower your blood pressure, improve your cholesterol and triglycerides. I can help you have less joint pain. I can improve your digestion. I can lower your risk of heart disease, diabetes, fatty liver disease, and cancer. I can help you have better cognitive function. I can improve your body image and help you have more self-love. And I can help you have less depression, anxiety, loneliness, and most importantly, higher self-esteem. So if that is something that you want, then you are in the right place. So just, just type yes in the chat if you're like, yes, this is, I'm here, I'm in the right place. Yes, this is what I want. This is why I'm here on this call. If, it, if any of those things. But here's the thing um, that, it, that you need to know uh, in order for me to be able to get you there, you have to do one thing. You have to have faith. Okay. And I'm not talking about the spiritual faith that you're used to thinking of, but it is similar. It's very similar, but you have to have faith. If this type of faith requires you to have number one, faith in the process. I like to think of it as I am, I see you on the side of the road. Okay. And I am driving this vehicle. 
right? It could be a bus, it could be, uh, you know, it could be a, a, a smaller car. But basically, I'm telling you on the side of the road, I'm like, where do you want to go? And, you know, if you want to go to Texas, I can drive you to Texas. I can get you there. You want to go to Florida? I can drive you there. You want to, you know, what is it your destination is? I know that I can get you there. Um, and you already kind of mentally decide on your destination in that last slide. Now, but you have to have faith that the vehicle can get you there, whether it's a bus or a small car, you know, that the vehicle that I'm driving can get you there. You also have to have faith in me, the driver, and in this program um, that I know the roads. I've driven there before. I have gone down this path with multiple people. Uh, you know, I've been teaching this for years. I have been driving for a long time. I've had a lot of people come into my bus and I've been able to get them to where they want to go. Sometimes people get out of my bus. Sometimes they're like, never mind. This is taking too long. I don't want to do this. <laughs> and they they lose faith, right? They kind of, they're like, I don't want to do it this way. Maybe I should fly. Maybe I should do something else. Um, but I promise you that once you decide on something, that if you have faith in the process, if you have faith in the program, and most importantly, if you have faith in yourself, the passenger, if you have faith in yourself that you're like, okay, I made this decision, I'm going to stick to this and I'm going to follow everything. I'm going to sit here in my seat and I'm going to get to my destination, even if we might go on some different roads because, you know, things are never a straight line. It's never as simple as point A to point B. Um, that you still need to have faith in the vehicle, the driver, and, and yourself as the passenger. Faith in the process, the program, and in yourself. So I'm asking you to have faith. Please write a yes in the chat if you're ready. If you feel like, okay, I have faith um, in, in this process. I have faith in this program. I have faith in myself. And even if you have just a mustard seed worth of faith, that's something we can work with. Uh, and so, you know, it doesn't have to be like, I know for sure, because if you know, that's not faith. Faith is always stepping into the dark without this assurance that things are going to happen. That's knowledge. You have knowledge once, you, once you've once you already gone through the process. Right now, you have to be willing to step into the dark. And after faith, faith kind of works off of, you know, you, you've seen maybe someone, other, some, someone else's uh, weight loss journey through a plant-based diet, and you've seen that they've had success, so you have faith. Hope is a little bit different. Hope doesn't look back in its trust. Hope looks forward. Hope is also harder to have, especially if you've struggled with your weight for years. If you feel like you constantly have a struggle with weight, it's really hard to have hope. But I'm asking you to have hope. I'm asking you to have hope that you can feel better. You can have less joint pain. You can improve your digestion. You can lose weight. And I want you to not just lose a couple pounds. I want you to find your greatest goal, your greatest dreams, you know, those big goals. I don't want you to have hope in just tiny things. And if you need to start with just those little goals, you know, maybe losing one pound this month. Awesome. But have hope. Don't give up on that hope. And then lastly, and I'll go into detail about this one a little later, but you have to have charity, right? You have to love yourself through the process. Um, you really have to be patient on yourself, with yourself, have more compassion, love yourself through this whole process. So let's learn how. We're, we're, I'm going to go into the specifics. Don't worry. I'll go into the details and help you really understand how we're going to um, get you where you want to go in this vehicle and get you through this process. Okay. So you don't have a food problem. <laughs> you may think you have a food problem, but I'm here to tell you you're not overweight or not where you want to be just because you have a food problem. It's so much deeper than that. Most likely you already know things that you can do to lose weight. You already have the knowledge, right? The understanding is there, whether it's plant-based or some other way, you know that if you, you know, maybe track your calories or do any other way that that can help you. But the reason why the typical weight loss programs don't work is because of all the deeper layers that we need to work on first before we work on just the actions. If you are constantly criticizing yourself, feeling unworthy, feeling like this isn't for you, it, that you that you see other people lose weight, but that will never happen to you. If you are doubting your abilities, then it's going to show up in your body. Okay. It, we need to work on those doubts first. And that's why I say you have to have faith because faith and doubt cannot coexist. 
So as soon as you doubt, you've lost faith. And it's almost like you're jumping out of the car. You're like, I don't believe anymore. I don't have faith anymore. And you jump right out. So I want you to really work on that doubt um, because it's going to show up in your body. It's going to show up in your results. When you start treating yourself with kindness and compassion with that charity, like we talked about, you naturally will start making better choices for yourself. If you give yourself grace, if you love yourself through it, right? You'll start to nourish your body with the foods that make you feel good. The goal of all this, I'm going to teach you what foods these are. I'm going to teach you why these foods are so good for you, but I want you to start to become in tune with how food feels in your body and really be more intuitive with what you're eating and how that makes you feel afterwards. If you were to, you know, want something salty and start snacking on chips. Yeah, sure. The first couple are fine. If you're like me, I went to the movies today and I, my, my daughter wanted popcorn. I let her have some and I ate probably a little too much. Right. And I started to feel it in my body. And so I knew that it was time to stop. I want you to be able to get to that point where you are so in tune with your body, you know, when to stop, um, that you're making choices because of how your body feels versus how the food tastes that you're able to recognize that things taste good, but you also can recognize when it's time to stop that you don't need to keep going. I want you to do this in a way that feels enjoyable. That's fun. That's exciting. That's delicious. And I want you to be able to practice self-care in all aspects of your life. So being able to do all of that, that is where we can make true change. It's not just changing your actions on what foods you're choosing and when, and you know, if you're intermittent fasting or not, or if how much protein you're eating or not, or how many plants you're eating or not. It's all the deeper levels underneath that we really need to work on. And again, we have to do with charity. Charity never faileth. It is one of the most powerful practices that you can do is to drop the shame, drop the blame, drop all of that. If you, if you did eat too many chips or if you did eat too much popcorn, do not give yourself a hard time about it, right? If you had too many cookies, if you had whatever it is, just be like, I don't feel good. This is a data point. This is me experimenting like a scientist and looking at it neutrally without judgment. And you see, okay, after I've eaten this much, I don't feel good but we take away the judgment, just like a scientist is looking, you know, at your eating patterns and writing down, huh? Okay. When they eat this much, they feel this way. What about when they eat these things? They feel this way. It's purely scientific. It's data-driven. I do not want you to attach shame or blame or feel terrible about yourself or tell yourself that you can't do this and you were never meant to do this. Let's, let's pull back those layers, practice charity with yourself and with others, with other people in your family who may not be on board with how you want to eat right now, or, or when you do the emotional eating challenge and have to follow a specific meal plan and, and they don't want you to do this, right? They, you, you need to recognize that, that in order to be successful, you have to have charity and understanding for them too. Remember that a lot of times food is connected with our culture. It's difficult to change that. A lot of us show our love through food. It's like, oh, it's your birthday. We're so grateful that you were born this day. Let's have cake. It's, this is a cultural thing. This is how our cultural works. It's really hard to change that. And so it's okay to recognize like this is part of our human experience, that food can be associated with love and to see it in that way only and not put extra shame or judgment on top of it. So we're really trying to pull out those layers. Okay. That was all the introduction. <laughs> so let's get deeper into um, what exactly you need to do in order to find success in your weight loss journey. So there's three things. Number one is action. Number two is your thoughts. And number three is connecting with others and being part of a community. We will um, talk about you know action today. We'll go into the details. By the end of this day, you will know exactly what you need to do to meet your weight loss goals. You will know those simple actions. And then tomorrow, you don't want to miss tomorrow because tomorrow I think is even more important because, you know, <laughs> as a man thinketh, so is he. So what you're thinking, what's going on underneath is going to really end up making your results happen. And then lastly, day three, we dive deep into all of those doubts of, yeah, this can work for other people, but this couldn't work for me because of who I live with, how, what my kids are doing. I don't have time. I don't have money. I don't have any of those things. We will dive into those because I want you to know that this is possible for you. And I want you to believe and have faith that it is. And so my goal is to be able to squash all of those doubts and help you see this path, this way through this vehicle, and that it's your choice to hop in and to just have faith. Okay. So 
action. Before we go deeper into weight loss, I do need to talk about the elephant in the room, and that is diet culture. <laughs> that most of the time, diet culture emphasizes a certain body size. And, you know, I just saw the Barbie movie today. Like it's it's front and clear. Like there's this perfect image that we have in our mind. And I want you to know that depending on your age, depending on your stage in life, we're looking for weight loss. Um, but we're looking to really maintain and obtain the, the optimal body size for your stage in life. And so we, you know, want you to know that we recognize that the, a huge motivation to losing weight is to achieve the ideal body size. But if you make health a priority, so if we swap it around that instead of making the weight loss a priority, if we choose to make the health a priority, um, it makes a big difference because if you make health a priority, weight loss is just a side effect. If we work on that deeper inner person, you know, and, and give yourself more self-love and work on really being healthy, not only in the actions that you're making with food, but also in your thoughts and, and who you are inside, then weight loss is just a side effect. However, if you make weight loss your priority, I mean, honestly, you could be eating a, a, a Twinkie diet and still lose weight but it could lead obviously to disordered eating. So we wanna make sure that we're staying clear of disordered eating, that as we are looking to lose weight and make that a priority, that we're, we're really prioritizing health and weight loss is a side effect. And so as you're doing that, it's important to recognize all of the other non-scale victories or the victories that don't relate to weight loss. So like better hair, better skin, better nails, less joint pain, less inflammation, better digestion, you know, sleeping better, not having acid reflex, like all of those simple things. If we can just even, even just the acid reflex alone, um, make that your goal. You'll see that it, as you do that, you'll recognize, okay, you're feeling better. You're starting to be healthier and you may even start to lose weight. We all have a different body. I could be eating the exact same thing that you're eating and it could look totally different. <laughs> so it's important for us to focus on how you feel um, and more than how you look, especially in the beginning. Really, really think. I want you to just almost drop all, like you're here because of weight loss, but I want you to drop the weight loss goal and just be here because you want to, to really recognize how food feels in your body and choose foods based off of that feeling more than anything else. And nutrition is super nuanced. I'm not going to tell you that eating this specific way is the best way always and forever. Uh, nutrition is nuanced. There is no one size fits all diet. What works for me may not work for you. Um, and there's benefits and risks to any diet you choose to follow any diet. There's always going to be those benefits and risks, even a plant focused diet, which is what I love to follow. But even then it's like, you still need to take your B12. You still need to be aware of your iron needs. You still need to be aware of other things. So there's always going to be benefits and risks, but the goal is to choose the least amount of risks for, for what it is that you want. So if you are here because you want to lose weight, like th that's my jam, right? I work with women usually who are older, um, who are 40 or older, or even in their late thirties, um, and who don't necessarily want to be bodybuilders. <laughs> if you want to be a bodybuilder, I'm not your person to follow. Um, that's probably, a, uh, even if you're vegan, like a vegan bodybuilder to follow and, and you will need to eat a little bit more protein if you're looking to tone up, right? Most of the people who come to me just want to lose weight so that they can have less joint pain who may already have an underlying kidney issue and can't eat a lot of protein who may have already had weight loss surgery and have recognized that they can't handle meat anymore. And that's a really common one. A lot of the people who come to me, um, are having digestive issues or, or have had cancer before, or a family history of cancer or a family history of heart disease, you know, like that is what we're focused on today. And so that's what makes it different than the typical weight loss plan that you follow because the typical weight loss plan they're they're trying to help you become more of a bodybuilder and while that's great that doesn't work for many women who are older women for many older women like we're we're not you know in our 20s and we're not needing to to bulk up like it's a totally different situation and so why are we following these health and weight loss influencers that are telling you to eat in a certain way because they are in their 20s and they are younger and they they do have separate goals so it's important for you to understand what your goals are and to eat towards those goals and so when you go at to the gym because you you know you want to start exercising and being a little healthier and when when the the um, personal trainer is telling you to eat over you know a gram protein for every pound of weight, just think in your mind, okay, 
they have different goals. That is not what may be right for you in this stage of life. You are not 20 and you're not looking to become a bodybuilder. So it's a totally different, different meal plan that you should be following. And our goals should be different. And this is why, and I want to dive a little bit different as to why we're not looking to be a bodybuilder and why, as you're an, you know, an older woman, you're really looking to just feel better, to live longer, to be there for your kids, to be there for your grandkids. And it may not be, you know, more protein. Now, why is it that we always think about protein? Well, should we be eating more protein? Do we need to eat more protein? Well, I felt this way too. After my husband and I wanted to lose the baby weight after our twins were born. So our twins right now are four years old and they're our number five and number six. And I gained a lot of weight with my twin pregnancy and my husband gained a lot of sympathy weight with my twin pregnancy. So at that time we, you know, followed the typical plan that you see online, right? There was a influencer that we did their meal plan and it was a macro based meal plan. Uh, and it was high protein and it was working. It was totally working. We were both losing weight, right? Which is what you want, which is great. Right. Um, and I, no question, these plans work. But here's what I want to, to point out. It did not improve my husband's cholesterol, this diet plan, even though in general, when you lose weight, you are supposed, like most people, their cholesterol improves. Even if they went on a Twinkie diet, their cholesterol is going to improve, but not all the time, especially when you are focused on, on higher protein and depending on the protein you're eating, you may still have high cholesterol. You may still have high triglycerides or high blood pressure. And that's where we were, right? We were losing weight, but my husband's numbers were still elevated. We're higher than we wanted. And so at his annual checkup, the doctor noticed his cholesterol and he suggested making diet changes without saying what exactly, because doctors don't do that. <laughs> and he told him to exercise more, which made my husband so mad because at the time he was biking to work every day. He was exercising, which is, you know, it's a good five miles there, five miles back. So it's it, like, it was a decent amount of exercise. Uh, we were eating what we thought was a healthy diet, right? And so instead of coming home and, and wanting to make changes, we just didn't trust the doctors anymore or the numbers. And you'll see that time and time again, when people are, are following, you know, it, maybe their, their fitness instructor's meal plan and their numbers aren't improving, then they'll just say, oh, the numbers don't matter but I'm here to tell you those numbers matter. Those numbers matter. In fact, the higher your cholesterol is, the higher your risk of heart disease, pure and simple. There's nothing that can deny that. And so my husband's cholesterol, it wasn't above 200. Most of the time when it's above 200, that's when the doctor's gonna be like, okay, you really need to do something or maybe put you on a statin or do something crazy. But his was in the, in the 175 um, around that number, it's the yellow zone. But here's the thing, 35% of heart attacks actually happen in this range. And I don't have the specific number for strokes, but heart disease still happens in this range. It's not until you can get below 150 where heart disease is virtually non-existence, right? So experts believe that cholesterol is the only necessary factor for heart disease. So it's not something to ignore. If you have elevated cholesterol, I don't want to hear, oh, it's just it's genetic. I'm sure it is in some way, but you can always, always, always change your diet. You can always improve your cholesterol and it matters. <laughs> it matters. So if you've ever felt this way, chances are you can relate. For me, uh, we didn't really think much of it until on October 1st, 2019, I got that dreaded phone call where my husband was at work and he said, I'm on my way to the ER. Can you meet me there? I had no idea what was going on. He didn't really know what was going on. I was like, I'm not okay. I'm not sure what's going on. My coworkers say I have to go. I feel like I'm dying. You know, so it's like, okay. So we go, um, you know, I, I run, I meet him at the ER and I open the door and I see my husband, he's 37 years old. Okay. 37 years old. He's slumped over in his wheelchair and I look at him and he looked like he'd aged 50 years. He looked like an 80 year old man just right there. And my heart immediately knew he looks like, I was like, he looks like he's having a stroke. Like I knew in that moment. Um, but what I knew in my heart took, you know, hours and days for the doctors to really find out what was going on. Um, and they then again, concluded that he have, was having a stroke. It was affecting his vision. He ended up having um, double vision for months. We thought this, the, his vision issues 
would have been permanent. Like we had no idea if his brain would heal. Um, the good news is that he was young, um, but this this happens all the time. We would go to the the neuro ophthalmologist and see, you know, other men literally in their 80s with the eye patch on, and they've been like that for years. So I was just terrified. Like, how long is this going to happen? Is he going to have double vision? And it impacted his ability to work. He couldn't work. He couldn't drive. Um, you know, and it, it, there was so much. And I have six young kids at the time. I have twin nine-month-olds, right? So it was so overwhelming. And I couldn't help but remember as I was driving home from the hospital, calling my mom, telling her what happened. And it just that flashback of when my mom called me after, you know, she had been with my dad when he had, sorry, when he was just 55 years old and had his one and only heart attack because he passed away. Um, and I remember at the time, as soon as my mom told me that my, my dad was dead, I, I kneeled down and I started praying. I was like, God, please like, no, don't take him. Like, give him a second chance. Let him have a second chance to live. Like, let him make changes. And he didn't, he didn't have a second chance. It was his only heart attack. And he was gone just like that. And I was, was so overwhelmed at the time and wished just that, that it could have been different. And so when my husband had a stroke and when we were in the hospital and we were told that, you know, we have to follow a heart healthy diet, I was like, okay, I got the answer to my prayer, not to my dad, but to my husband. And I was willing to make any change possible to help him live longer and to help him have, get his vision back. Because when you're a healthy person, you have so many wishes, right? You can do anything. But when you're a sick person, you only have one wish and that is to get better. And I had one wish and that was for my husband's vision to come back. And the other wish is that we would not have to do this again because I knew with my dad, like I, we take enough risks. And once you've had one stroke, you're very likely to have another stroke. And so what was it that we needed to do to change? Um, we left the hospital with no clear direction. There was no hole in his heart. There, there was no genetic history. There was no heart arrhythmia. There was no reason why a 37 year old would be having a stroke. Um, but we were told, okay, so you need to follow a heart healthy diet, which includes to avoid trans fat, avoid saturated fat, avoid cholesterol, eat more fiber and avoid alcohol. Now we're not alcohol drinkers. So that was already done, but all the other things I didn't even know what that was. I was like, what is trans fat? <laughs> what is saturated fat? You know, cholesterol, I knew it was related to eggs in some way. Was fiber just the fiber one bars? Like, I didn't know. Even though I thought I was eating healthy, even though I thought like we're pretty intelligent people. Um, you know, my husband's an attorney. I got my master's degree. Like we are smart and capable humans, but I had no idea what foods I was supposed to avoid or what specifically this meant and what I was supposed to make for dinner, you know? And so it, I went on a deep dive and I really wanted to know how we could eat heart healthy and why, and why does saturated fat influence things? And why does trans fat influence things and why fiber and how it all works together? Well, as I went on my deep dive, I found that meat um, is the, you know, a natural source of, of trans fat and cholesterol and that dairy is the primary source of saturated fat and that there's added fats and sugars, right. Are all devoid of nutrients like fiber and that we need fiber that most of us are actually fiber deficient. We're not eating enough fiber and that refined grains are devoid of nutrients like fiber, right? So same, same thing there. And that fiber actually only comes from plants, not just the fiber one bars, but from plants. So that we need to be eating more plants, more fruits, more vegetables, more legumes, more whole grains, more nuts and seeds, that that's where fiber comes from. And again, only about three to 5% of Americans are even getting enough fiber every day. And that number is closer to about 20, 25 grams of fiber if you're a woman or 35 grams of fiber if you're a man. Now, why was this all important and how does this come into play? Well, the top causes of death in America, number one is heart disease. Number one is heart disease, just like my dad passed away from. Um, number two is cancer. And these things really can be influenced by what we eat. I'm not telling you that you're never going to have a heart attack or you're never going to have cancer if you eat a perfect diet because you can't minimize all risk. 
but you can do something. And if you've gone through, you know, a traumatic health event, you may feel hopeless. You may feel helpless that you, you don't know what to do. And so if there's some power that you can be given, there's some choice, it's nice to know that there are little things that you can do to minimize your risk. Um, and stroke goes into that too, right? Uh, along with, with respiratory diseases, Alzheimer's disease. I found that diabetes, uh, you know, kidney disease, all of these things really are so significantly related, um, by really eating more plants and not just eating less meat, but it's about what you're adding in more than what you're taking out. It's making sure that you're eating enough of the good stuff, not just taking out the bad stuff, that it, not the food is good or bad, but enough of the nutrient dense foods <laughs> and less of the less nutrient dense foods. Okay. So I don't know about you, but after my husband's stroke, when, or if you've gone through a significant health issue, I would just lie in bed and wonder what was going on in his body? Like, I want to know, I want to look inside. I want to understand how this happens. How does a 37 year old have a stroke? Um, and I learned this very similar to heart attacks and that it, it doesn't require, like when you think of a heart attack, when I thought of my dad's heart attack, I thought that he just, you know, he was overweight. And so he was just, he just eating and his, his plaque just built up so much that it clogged that clogged his arteries. That's what I assumed had happened. That's what most people assume happens, but that's actually not the case. Most heart attacks um, happen, I'd say 90% of them, only 10% happen when there's a complete blockage uh, from plaque. But 90% of heart attacks happen when you um, break basically this, this lining, this lining in your endothelial cells or the lining inside of your arteries. So when plaque builds up, you're, you still have a lining on top of that. And those are your endothelial cells. And when you add high blood pressure against that plaque, it's just like rubbing on something. And just like I were to rub my carpet for a long time, it's going to create ruptures in it, right? It's going to, it's going to wear it down. And so when you have that high blood pressure, so the night before my husband had a stroke, he worked out really hard. He really pushed himself, which normally you would think that's great. But again, I think that it did contribute to that wearing down what was going on in those delicate arteries, especially in those delicate ones in your brain. And when the rupture happens, it can cause blood to come and clot to heal the break. Just like if I were to scratch my arm, that blood's going to come and clot it to heal the break. And normally that's great. Your, your body will heal it. It will be fine. And then that clot will kind of dissipate. But sometimes that clot ends up blocking blood flow, which can cause the heart attack. Or that clot can end up breaking free and causing a stroke, right? Especially if the clot's happening around, you know, those arteries in your brain. And so when I really understood that, I, I recognized that we really do need to focus on that plaque. Um, and what is it that builds up the plaque? Well, it's a buildup of fat. It's a buildup of cholesterol as well, well as other substances. And this is what we really need to focus on is really preventing that buildup of plaque. And you've, you've heard this a million times, like this is not new news, but for me, understanding exactly what was going on and how this happens and what foods are connected to it was key. So how does plaque build up? How, how does it even happen that you have this plaque where your endothelial cells are covering and then end up rupturing? Well, it all starts with LDL cholesterol. <laughs> this is why cholesterol matters. If you have higher LDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol is just sticky. It ends up, it's, and it kind of sticks in, and starts to come inside. And when it comes inside, you have these, these monocytes that will come and basically um, they're like Pac-Man and they're going to try and kind of clean up all of that LDL cholesterol that came inside. And so these little monocytes are these little Pac-Mans going to clean everything up. And the bigger their mouth gets with all of that LDL cholesterol, the more full it gets, it becomes what's called a, a macrophage. And these are start to get really inflammatory, but the, it's, it's not too bad, but the bigger they get, they kind of collect with other macrophages and end up becoming foam cells yeah, or, you know, these little fatty droplets and foam cells. And what happens is this is like the birth of inflammation inside of your arteries. There's a lot of inflammation there. There's a lot. It's, it's like a, it's like frat guys coming to a party and messing everything up. You know, it's just, there's, there's a lot going on in there. 
And um, when that causes inflammation, that's why your body tries to put the cap over it to keep everything at bay. But it can't just get rid of get rid of it that easily, right? It does require a change in diet. It does require you to make changes in your body. But as you as you continue to eat the way you're typically eating and, and the LDL stays high, then this process just continues to go on. And then when the hypertension occurs or that high blood pressure, it puts pressure on that cap, which weakens the walls and increases the risk of breaking it open. Okay, so that's all the sciencey stuff, <laughs> but it's important for us to understand what exactly is going on underneath and how you should be eating to lower your cholesterol, to lower that LDL cholesterol. So what should you be eating or what should you be avoiding? We're first going to talk about what you should be avoiding. The number one thing that influences the amount of LDL cholesterol, the number one dietary thing, I should say, that influences the amount of cholesterol going on um, in your body, LDL cholesterol, is trans fat. Okay, so trans fat has actually been banned, banned since 2020. The FDA banned it from use except in trace amounts. So you will still see trace amounts of trans fats in fried foods, right? You'll still see trace amounts um, in, in cooking oils, in um, even just things that are shelf stable, like any type of products that you're buying, um, that anything less than one gram, right, is, is still okay. So maybe just like a cupcake that's been on the shelf forever at the grocery store, anything that has been there for a while. The reason why they love trans fat is it's very shelf stable, which is, it's great for keeping food lasting fresher and longer, but not great for your arteries, not great for the inside. And so um, it's also important to recognize that there are natural trans fats that are found in ruminant animals like cows and goats. Um, and there's still a lot of research just debating on if it has the same effect as a trans fat in, in those fried foods. Um, it doesn't look like it's as strong, but it's still important to recognize. Um, all of these things, right, can impact your health, especially if you're already insulin resistant, and it can increase the amount of free radicals that are going on, which we'll go into detail a little bit more. Now, what's next? So if you're not eating a lot of fried foods, if you're not eating a lot of this shelf stable products, like microwave popcorn has some trans fat or, or store-bought dough has some trans fat, like the frozen, frozen breads and doughs and, and pizzas, those things have trace amounts. So if you're not eating a lot of those, then most likely you should be focusing on avoiding the amount of saturated fat that you are consuming. So who can tell me in the chat, <laughs> um, what the number one source of saturated fat is in the American diet. So in the chat, tell me if you know the number one source of saturated fat, if you know what that is. Go ahead and write it in the chat. You know what it is. Butter, close, close. Cheese, yes, yes. Dairy for sure, like overarching is dairy's number one, but if you were to go more specifically, it is cheese. That's just, it, you know, not to say there's a lot of saturated fat in butter because there is, it's just that we eat more cheese than we eat butter. Um, but uh, as Americans, we're eating a lot of cheese and it really is one of the biggest culprits to our rising cholesterol levels. Um, but more than that is beef. So beef is number two. Um, and then we have our butter eggs, milk, um, and other products like those cakes and biscuits as well. Cookies, you know, anything that has a lot of the, the butter in there too. Coconut oil also is high in saturated fat and palm oil. So those plants are not, you know, immune from high saturated fat. We should be watching how much we're eating. And when replacing saturated fat, with refined grains. So this is fascinating because you may think, okay, I'm just going to take out the animal products. Well, there's a lot of debate. You may have seen like that time article where they said butter is back. And why is it? What research were they pointing to? And they were pointing to this study or other studies that have been similar, where if you take out saturated fat, but then replace saturated fat with refined grains, think like snack wells or a lot of these like white breads and, you know, white tortillas, white rice, all of these things, um, these refined grains. While you've taken on the animal products, if you just replace them with chips and processed foods, you're actually just as likely to die from cardiovascular disease. <laughs> However, if you replace saturated fats, you take out saturated fat with, with polyunsaturated fat or with whole grains, um, then it actually does reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. So it's not just about where you're taking it out. It's what are you replacing it with? 
because refined stuff isn't any better. Even though it's maybe not as high in saturated fat, it's not going to reduce your risk. There's going to be other issues that it causes. And so we need to recognize that too, that it's not just taking out the cheese if you're just going to replace it with with chips, right? <laughs> so we want to make sure that we recognize that um, and are still reducing your risk by trying to eat those whole grains and those healthy fats. Okay, so next on the list is cholesterol. Now, cholesterol um, naturally forms in your body. So who can tell me what the, what the number one food, the highest food um, source of cholesterol is, if you know? If anyone is pretty obvious, if there's a picture of it, <laughs> you know what it is. Um, it is eggs. So eggs are going to be the highest food source, um, but your body already makes enough cholesterol. So you do not need to eat cholesterol. But what happens when you wait for most people, most people, when you eat cholesterol, your body's like, oh, you ate more cholesterol. So I'm going to produce less. Okay. So that's great. Your body works that way. That's how it's supposed to work. Things are awesome. So if you were to go to the doctor, get your cholesterol measured, and if you have low cholesterol, then you probably don't need to really worry about eating cholesterol. You still should worry about saturated fat, but cholesterol, when it goes down to good, better, best, right? The worst thing um, for your cholesterol increasing is the trans fat. Then it's the saturated fat, which we really need to focus on. Then it's cholesterol. So that's why they're saying it's not a big deal to eat eggs. Well, if you already have high cholesterol, then you may be about 25% of the population, which is known as their hyper responders. And that they basically, when you're eating cholesterol, they don't, your body doesn't adjust. So if you're eating cholesterol and your body is producing cholesterol, you're just going to have more cholesterol. So if you already have high cholesterol, you should be avoiding eggs, period. Like that it, you don't want to take that risk. Um, and those hyper responders, their body may not be adjusting, even though some studies show that you're fine. Well, if your cholesterol is low, you're probably fine. But even then, even then there's still risk. If you have, you know, other medical conditions, um, you still may want to avoid eggs for, for multiple reasons. And, and there's just research that shows that no matter what, they should be used sparingly. If you are going to be eating them, that eating them in high amounts can still increase your risk of other diseases like cancer if they're eaten in a large amounts, right? Okay, so the biggest contributors to rising blood cholesterol levels are number one, trans fats, right? Trans fatty acids, saturated fats, dietary cholesterol, um, and less, you know, again, you're not a hyper responder, then you don't have to worry about it as much. Now, even though dietary cholesterol level has a minimal direct effect on blood cholesterol levels, it is worth noting that eating a lot of cholesterol can increase LDL's vulnerability to oxidation, which increases plaque formation. So again, it's the oxidized fat. So you want to eat as many antioxidants as possible and eat less foods that are going to affect oxidation that may be happening inside your body. And those are going to be from animal-based products, usually promote more oxidation because of even heme iron, for example. Heme iron, which is found only in animal products. I mean, it's good if you're low in iron, you need iron, um, but in general, it is also pro-oxidant. And so it can promote atherosclerosis as well. And for, and, and for all of these reasons, for all of this that I've said, if you forget everything that I've already talked about, I want you to remember this. For every 1% decrease in cholesterol levels, there is a two to 4% decrease in heart disease risk. So even if you can just eat meat more sparingly, right? Even if you can maybe just not eat it as much, not with every meal, every night, every lunch, right? If you can just decrease the amount of cheese that you're consuming, if you're eating more whole grain, just, just a little bit, even just little changes, even if you never go all the way in, you can still decrease your risk of heart disease. So even small changes matter. Now, I've said this before and I'll say it again, it's almost more important what you're adding in than what you're taking out. And so I really want you to focus more on meeting the, fi the, the fiber requirements, the RDA for fiber, which is 25 grams of fiber a day if you're a woman, 35 grams of fiber if you're a male. If all you did was focus on that number, that will significantly improve your health. Why? Fiber grabs onto the fats 
and the cholesterol that are hanging out in your small intestines, which is important because your body is really good at recycling. And so if there's cholesterol just hanging out in your intestines, your body will actually reabsorb it into your bloodstream because it likes to recycle things it's super efficient. So what you want to do to lower your cholesterol levels is eat more fiber because fiber acts as a scrub brush. You have soluble fiber, which keeps you full. And so you're not overeating, right? It's, it's a natural way. So you don't overeat on your food. Then you have insoluble fiber, which acts as that scrub brush going through your intestines, pulling out excess cholesterol, pulling out excess hormones, pulling out all of the things, all the toxins, all the things you don't want. So you need to be going to the bathroom often and frequently, um, not too frequently, but you know what I mean? You need to be regular. <laughs> um, fiber all also is uh, going to help reduce the amount of bile salts that are reabsorbed in the intestine. Your body, in order to make bile, um, it needs cholesterol. So as you're going number two more often, your body's going to be using more cholesterol to make the bile and therefore it's going to help to lower your cholesterol levels as well. Now, I don't want to forget about triglycerides because you may be thinking, okay, you know, I, I eat kind of plant-based. I don't, a lot of women who end up following my ads or following me, um, really, they are drawn to the fact of not eating a high protein diet because they never really liked meat anyway. But the problem is they still like to snack and <laughs> they, they like to eat usually later at night, um, after a long day. And it could be sweet snacks. It could be salty. It could be a mix of both. And what happens when you're constantly snacking is you may end up having these higher triglyceride levels. And we don't want to ignore those. Triglycerides are basically just fat cells that store energy in your body. It can be obtained through diet right through eating all of that or the body creates triglycerides from extra calories consumed so you can get it specifically from the foods or you can get it just because you like to snack just because you like to eat um and even if they're not you know not the animal foods if you're over consuming calories it's going to affect your triglyceride levels and when triglyceride levels are consistently high it can also contribute to plaque buildup in the blood vessels Okay. So I, again, it's all about what you are eating and less about what you're taking away, because even if you're, you're eating, you know, not eating animal products, if you're still snacking a lot on these processed foods, it's going to affect your triglyceride levels, which will also affect the plaque that's going on inside of you. So this is what's fascinating. Those who consume plant-based diets can still have high triglyceride levels, just like I said, due to consuming too many refined carbohydrates or added sugars. But when the focus is on whole foods and low fat intake, research suggests that vegans actually have the lowest triglyceride levels of all dietary groups. The research is clear. If you're doing it in the whole food plant-based way, then you really will have not only be able to lose weight, but you will be incredibly healthy on the inside, which honestly is what matters more than anything. Now, we don't want to forget about the high blood pressure, because as you remember, that high blood pressure can, you know, constantly wear down on those endothelial cells and on the plaque, which causes the rupture. So with high blood pressure, how do you reduce your blood pressure? This is where um, it's important to reduce your sodium intake. It's important to reduce your alcohol intake. Um, can you tell me what the number one source of sodium is and for adults in the American diet? For adults, what is the number one food source of sodium for adults on the American diet? This one's kind of a tricky question. I'm going to let you think about it for a second. If anyone, feel free, feel free to take a guess in the chat. All right. The answer? <laughs> Bread, that's close, close. Um, it's actually chicken. Chicken for the standard American diet, um, chicken. And that is because it is injected with a sodium mixture in order to make it uh, weigh more and therefore they can sell it for more money. So it's a sodium, you know, water mixture, which makes the chicken breasts, you know, swell up more and therefore weigh more. And so when you buy, you know, a pound of chicken, it's gonna cost more because of that injected sodium and water. Now, um, for children, it's actually cheese. <laughs> so for adults, it's chicken. For children, it's cheese, mostly from pizza. <laughs> so it's something to, to take into consideration. There's a lot of sodium in cheese as well. Now, it's, again, not just what we're taking out, but we want to focus on what we're adding in. And so 
one of the important things to help reduce your blood pressure is to eat more omega-3. So those healthy fats, omega-3s are, you know, going to be found in walnuts, are going to be found in avocados, in other nuts and seeds. And the thing about whole plant foods, like beans, for example, if you're using beans as your protein source, it's going to be significantly lower in sodium or even tofu. It's going to be just lower in sodium, which is going to help reduce that sodium in your body. Um, but more than that, if you're eating a lot of plants, they're going to be higher in things like potassium and magnesium. And those are key to help lower your blood pressure. And that is because the more potassium you eat, the more sodium you lose through your urine. So when you're eating potassium rich foods, which are going to be potatoes, there'll be spinach, it will be tomatoes, avocados, bananas, right? Those potassium rich foods will help basically pull the excess sodium that's in your bloodstream and put it into your urine. And it will help ease the tension on your blood vessel walls. Um, you know, even citrus fruits is going to help open things up, keeping things more flexible. Uh, walnuts, all these things are going to be so good to help keep things um, healthy inside. White beans, beets, bok choy, right, are other things um, that I didn't mention earlier too. Okay, so that was everything everything to do with heart disease. So the number two, like number two cause of death in America is cancer and cancer rates are rising and they're rising rapidly. So what affects your risk of cancer and how can we minimize your risk, especially as younger and younger people are getting cancer? Again, a healthy person has a million wishes. You could be, I mean, I'm sure we all know very fit, healthy people who've been diagnosed with cancer. And while there's so many things that I'm going to show you, there's cancer is very complicated. So I don't want to simplify it. I don't want you to think that if you just ate this way, then you'll never ever have cancer. I want to be completely clear and realistic that it is very nuanced. Um, but in general, that if you can minimize your risk by some dietary things, why not? Why not, right? Even though cancer is complex and there's no simple treatments, cancer all starts in the same way. All of us right now have cancer growing within us. And I don't want you to be scared. This is not to scare you, but it's just, we've all been exposed to carcinogenic compounds. We've all been exposed to something that may have initiated that tumor, right? And once initiation happens, it never, rarely, if ever reverses. So we've all had those cancers initiated, kind of like the smaller than the tip of a pen. All right, so it's very, very, very small. What matters though, is when it starts to grow. And that's the, the promotion, the tumor form formation or promotion stage of cancer. And you could be there for years, for decades even, you know, from that tip of, tip of a pen to in order for it to get even, even detectable on scans, that it could take years. And so this is where it matters what you're eating. It matters how you're living, how much stress you have, how much sleep you're getting, um, and, and how many fruits and vegetables you're eating, honestly, because we want as many of those antioxidants as possible to help that and prevent that cancer from growing. Cancer is usually only discovered after that progression phase. So that's when it's big enough to be discovered. That's when it's harder to reverse anything. It's hard. It, you still can make diet changes. And I suggest that you do no matter what, but it's a totally different situation than the promotion stage. The promotion stage, you can have more flexibility after the progression stage. It's a little bit harder. Um, now, I'm going to talk about angiogenesis and why what you eat matters in tumor formation, because angiogenesis is when blood vessels form around cancer, around the tumors, because cancer, just like anything else, it needs nutrients, it needs nutrients to grow. And it's going to basically tell your body to form blood vessels around it so that it can get nutrients. But what's amazing What's amazing is there are anti-angiogenesis foods, which basically specific plant foods are going to tell your body, no, don't, don't feed, don't, don't grow blood vessels around that tumor. Um, it's going to stop that angiogenesis from happening and it can really delay the progression of cancer from growing over time. And so eating these plant foods are key. Now, of course, our, in our medical world, there are anti-angiogenesis drugs as well that can be used to block that tumor, uh, those tumor from getting the blood vessels. But let's start with those plant foods. Let's eat more plant foods to help prevent the tumors from getting the nutrients um, that they need in order to grow. 
And the metastasis is when cancer cells have moved to other tissues and, and it's just growing, right? That again, once it's reached that point, it makes it very, very difficult for dietary changes to make much of a difference. Now, this is also why there's so much research that shows what you eat matters, um, that these are called um, telomeres. So the length of a telomere, I, I want you to think of your DNA. At the end of your DNA is like the cap of a shoelace. You know, the telomeres are the caps of the shoelace on your DNA. And just like when the caps are worn down or disappear, your shoelaces start to unravel. It's the same thing with your DNA inside of your body. And so we want to keep those caps nice and strong, nice and long. And there's really a, a connection between how long your telomeres are and how how long of a lifespan that you have left. And there's been so much research that shows that the key to control aging is to keep those telomeres long, that the longer they are, um, the longer you'll be able to live. Well, in a prostate cancer study, um, Dr. Ornish found that after three months on a plant-based diet, that the enzyme that repairs the length of those telomeres increased by 30% in patients, while at the same time, that enzyme decreased in the control group, which is usually what happens when you have cancer. So at that cellular level, um, you know, and repairing and lengthening your lifespan, what you eat matters. Um, and again, I'm not going to lie that the stress also matters. Sleep also matters, but we're here to talk about eating in a way to help you lose weight. And I want you to know that if you want to lose weight and live longer, that it's not just about eating a ton of protein. We want to eat a lot more legumes, right? We want to eat more beans. We want to eat more nuts. We want to eat more seaweed, more fruits and more vegetables because they are inversely associated, um, you know, with, with, with all of these things, with all of these diseases, right? Whereas alcohol or red or processed meat is going to increase your risk of heart disease and cancer. There's so much research that shows that. And so it's really hard for me to see people say, yes, follow this weight loss plan. Oh, by the way, there's a ton of red meat in here and there's a ton of deli meat or, you know, ham or bacon and all these things. Yes, you could lose weight. And you may think that that's going to get you to a healthier spot. Just like we thought that the way we were losing weight was helping us to be healthier. But if it's not improving your health numbers, then it's not improving your lifespan. So what matters is on the inside. Um, and there's other factors. So it's not just that, right? Um, believing that cancer is just based off of genes is a false idea that again, it's this progression stage It's when it, when it progresses, when it becomes bigger, that we really need to be doing things right now that we don't even know what's growing inside of our body. Uh, we need to, yes, avoid these environmental factors and not be exposed to other carcinogens. Um, but if, if we can avoid saturated fat, that is also key, that there is a huge link that suggests that high fat diets or high intakes of different types of fat in the diet um, are linked to several cancers, including colon cancer, lung, postmenopausal breast cancer, as well as heart disease and other chronic diseases. Okay, so this is another stat that I want you to listen to. For every 5% increase in saturated fat intake, it increases the risk of cancer mortality by 4%. So every 5% increase in saturated fat can also increase your risk of cancer by 4%. So it's huge. How you lose weight matters. What you're eating matters. We want to avoid all of these animal-based foods and minimize them. Eat meat sparingly. It matters for your long-term health. We want to eat, you know, these, the dairy sparingly as well. Now, um, I do have to mention that even if you are eating in a healthy way, but if you do have a higher amount of body fat, you are also at a higher risk of certain cancers just by carrying extra fat. It's going to increase your risk of kidney, colorectal, es es um, esophagus, pancreatic, and liver cancers. So I want you to want to lose weight. And I know you're here because you want to, but you, you recognize that it's not just to relieve the, the joint pain or improve your digestion that it's also to reduce your risk of cancer because body fatness triggers alterations to hormones, which can affect your insulin resistance, which can affect that chronic um, inflammation. Okay. So that's all of the science. Let me know if you have any questions, um, the science of what foods to be eating and what foods to be avoiding. Um, and now let's talk about your plan. So what is your 
plan. Um, how is it that you can make these dietary changes and what does your plate look like and what will your meals look like? And I'm here to tell you that the more simple you go, <laughs> that the more basic, the more likely you will to succeed. I have so many meal plans. I have a, a, a six week meal plan. I have a fall meal plan. I have a winter meal plan. I have a spring meal plan. I don't give you a meal plan specifically um, on during this challenge because I want you to go even simpler. Like I want you to start at the very basics and you'll get the very basics in the emotional eating weight loss section where I tell you how simple you should be eating because the more simple, the less overwhelmed, the more basic, the more likely you'll be able to stick to it, the more likely you'll be able to experience the benefits. But I also want you to be able to eat until you're full. There is no reason for you to be hungry. <laughs> like, I don't want you to feel like you need to be hungry in order to reach your goals. I am one who likes to eat a lot. And so I, it's really nice to be able to eat without restrictions. Um, and it makes a big difference. So understanding calorie density is key in order to understand how you can eat without restriction and still obtain your optimal body size. Basically, when you eat lower calorie dense foods, you can eat more food and still lose weight. Uh, how does that look and what is this? Well, let's look at it this way. Carrots have about 41 calories per 100 grams, where chocolate has 550 calories per 100 grams. So focusing on foods based off of calorie density um, is going to be a lot simpler than counting calories, and it's going to help you just naturally eat more nutrient-rich whole plant foods. And these nutrient-rich whole plant foods will automatically help your body fight off of cancer, heart disease, and other chronic diseases. So when you consume more of these foods, and this is why I've, while I've given you all the information, I told you from the beginning, it's more important what you're adding in than what you're taking out. So if you can add these things in, if you can focus on just simply getting five fruits and vegetables a day, every day and making that your priority, not the protein, not all the other things, just making that like, no matter what you're getting your five a day in at least, and then maybe even move it closer to eight to 10. If you can do that. It will naturally crowd out everything else. If at the end of the day you want a treat, but you're like, oh, I've only had four fruits and vegetables today. I need to eat an apple first, right? Then that's naturally going to crowd out how many chips or cookies you're going to be eating that night. So if that is your priority, if adding in is what you're focusing on and making sure that you're at least meeting the minimum of five fruits and vegetables a day, or at least getting the 25 grams of fiber a day, it's going to make a world of difference. Now, is restricting calories even good for your health? Is it even healthy to eat a low calorie diet? Honestly, there have been numbers, many, many studies that have shown that low calorie diets um, in comparison to non-restrictive diets can actually extend your lifespan. So it matters. I know it's comfortable to just be able to eat whatever, whenever you want. Like it's a comfortable spot that we're all, we all like to be in. But truthfully, if you are eating less calories in a comfortable way by prioritizing plants, it's going to extend your lifespan and it matters. And so I want you to really recognize that no matter what, you're going to eat the same amount of food. People, when given the option, are going to be eating the same amount regardless of calories. We desire to have a full stomach after eating. Our body feels full with 300 calories of carrots, but not with 300 calories of soda. So when you focus on the lower calorie foods, if you prioritize eating them first, if you preload on vegetables before every meal, if you just eat a bunch of vegetables first and then eat your dinner, um, it helps you really lower your calorie count without actually restricting anything in the traditional sense. I know this is basic. I know this sounds so simple, but it's important for you to understand that it's more than just simplicity, that your hormones are going to be affected at a deeper level. And you've probably heard this a million times that my hormones are off and that's why I can't gain or lose weight. And let's talk about what hormones that you may be talking about, how they're off, why you can't lose weight. Let's learn the science. Okay. So hormones um, that are involved with your body's energy stores, right? Like your body fat will are these signals that either tell you if you're hungry or if you're feeling full or satisfied. Okay. So these hormones are going to be leptin. And I always like that it's leptin because it lets you know you're full. 
It helps you know that you are full and the less body fat usually means um, that you have less leptin uh, so that, you, you know, that your body is naturally going to crave more food in general. However, insulin can actually impede the signal from working properly. So if you have too much insulin in your body, and we're going to talk about that in a second, um, it can block the signals from leptin. So you don't know when you're full because insulin could be, you know, rolling around in there. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but Grenlin, it's like when your stomach growls, like the Grenlin, it lets you know that you're hungry. So when you're hungry, your stomach growls, that Grenlin is telling you that you need to eat, right? It also will decrease insulin from being released. Uh, you no, know, cause you're, you're being, you're, you're hungry. Okay. So how does insulin play a role with leptin and Grenlin? Well, insulin tells your body to Number one, um, unlock the door that lets sugar into your bloodstream or, or your, not just your sugar, but when you're eating food in general, um, and it, it turns into, into glucose in your body and then your cells need it, right? Every cell in your body needs that glucose to function. And so sugar is brought in or that glucose is brought in and insulin is the key that unlocks the door that lets it into your cells. But insulin is also the hormone that tells your body to store fat or one of the hormones that tells your body to store fat. So when there is an excess of insulin, it blocks leptin's ability to signal. So it, it can't tell your body that you're full and you can't burn fat when too much insulin is present. So let me give you a scenario of when this may be happening. So say at night you've had dinner, but you want a snack. And so it's late at night and you're like, I'm just going to have some pretzels. Okay. So when you're eating pretzels, you're stacking on pretzels when and it's going to cause insulin to be inside your body and which is normal and fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But what's, what's happening is when insulin's present, it can't really tell leptin to do its job. And sometimes leptin will, if you're continuing to stack on the pretzels over and over, um, you don't know when you're full, like your body can't let you know that you're full. And your body's also in fat storage mode when insulin is in your body. So when you're snacking and snacking, your body's saying store fat, store fat, store fat, store fat. So we really, really, really want to set a timer at eight o'clock every night and stop eating. We need to give your body a break. We need to let insulin not be around so that your body can then switch gears and go into fat burning mode because it cannot burn fat when too much insulin is present. So if you're snacking all day long, especially on foods that are going to raise your insulin levels, then it's very difficult for you to lose weight. And that's why so many women over 40 who come in, who just don't necessarily love me or even cheese, or, but they like to snack on processed foods. That's what's preventing you from being able to lose weight. So if you can set that goal, you know, the, you're going to give yourself 12 hours overnight. That for 12 hours of the day, you're not eating so that the insulin can go away and that you can start to burn fat. Okay. So that's a huge goal. It's not just what you're eating um, or your, how you're eating, but it's also when you're eating. So try to give yourself that break if possible. Okay. Now lowering insulin levels um, is becoming insulin sensitive. I'm sure you've heard about this all the time. People talk about it, but the problem is if you're just measuring your blood sugar levels, you're only seeing this much of a picture, right? Because you could be eating bacon and butter all day long and have low insulin levels. But as you know, as you just learned, you're also increasing your risk of heart disease and cancer. <laughs> so we want to eat in a way that's going to help you keep the insulin levels low right? But also will help minimize your risk of these diseases. And so when you eat less fat and sugars from refined carbs, then you can, um, when you're, you know, decreasing all those things, then you can become more insulin sensitive. So it's not just the animal products. Like it's really important that we're not eating all those processed foods. And remember though, that eating less saturated fat is also important because when you have a lot of saturated fat in your body, what it does is it kind of gums up the lock. So the insulin can't do its job and unlock the door to let the glucose into your bloodstream. It gums up the lock. So then your body's like, oh, there's saturated fat present. I, I can't open the door. Let's send more insulin, send more insulin. It sends another guy with a key and another guy with a key until finally one of the guys with the key can open the door to let the glucose into your body. And so it's important to keep the saturated fat low. And so you're not just working on the symptoms of having, you know, less sugar in your bloodstream, but you're working on the underlying cause of that 
that fat gumming up the lock, which we're in making your body send out more insulin. So there's just so many layers to this, right? Which I go deeper into my, all of my programs. If you ever want to learn even more about all of these things, but again, it's the reason why it all matters. It matters that you're not eating a ton of processed foods. It matters that you're not eating um, a ton of saturated fat. And it matters that you're eating a lot of fiber, that you're nourishing your gut because your gut is key to your body size. It's one thing that I haven't even talked about yet, but just really quickly, I want to tell you about an animal study that used fecal samples from human twins of opposing body sizes. So one, one twin was, was overweight and one twin was thin. Okay. And it took the poop from these twins and placed it inside the mice, right? They put it up there. <laughs> and these mice then were fed the exact same diet. What was fascinating is that the body type transferred to the mice despite following the exact same diet. So the, the mouse who got the, the obese twins poop became obese. The mouse who got the thin twins poop stayed thin. So there's another factor that's going on, and that is your microbiome. Your microbiome can basically be like you swimming against the current or swimming with the current. It can be helping you in your weight loss goals, or it can be preventing you from getting your weight loss goals. So how do you improve your microbiome so that you are swimming with the current instead of against the current? How can you really help your gut so that your gut can help you? And that is by improving your, your intake of plants and by eating not just the same old things day in, day out, but by adding a little bit more of variety, by adding 30 different plants every week is key to prioritizing your gut health. I want you to think of your gut, like, um, just, it's like an, its own ecosystem, right? It's like the rainforest. And in the rainforest, you have snakes and you have trees and you have bugs and you have all of these other things going on. But when you're only feeding certain animals or insects in the rainforest, if they're all the mosquitoes, there's so many mosquitoes, right? And other bugs are dying off. It's not going to be a healthy environment, but you want the rainforest to, to the, all of the, the different organisms inside of the rainforest to be fed properly. And your microorganisms or your gut microbes inside of you need to be fed properly. And they are different ones have different taste preferences. Some love broccoli, some love love, you know, chickpeas, some love herbs and spices, some love different. So the more variety that you can add to feed the, all of the gut microbes and keep them strong and healthy, that's, what's going to improve your gut. Now, what can cause more inflammation is by eating again, too many animal products. Now the fermented foods will also help. So any, sometimes some of the fermented cheeses can help, but in general, too much animal products can really hurt your gut as well as alcohol, too much alcohol. When you think of alcohol, it's like it cleanses things. You, we use alcohol to clean things and alcohol can kill all the good and the bad <laughs> microbes in your gut. So you really want to reduce your alcohol intake to improve um, your gut. So you've learned all of the why. You've learned all of the details of all the things that have to come in place and why, and why you need to eat more plants because of all of these reasons. But how do you do it? How do you actually apply it in your life? Let me show you how you can eat more and lose weight. So again, you want to add in more vegetables, period. Enough said, we're done for today. Just kidding, no. You need more vegetables, any way you can get them. Um, anything that's green, let's eat more greens, right? Then after that is fruits. So if you prioritize vegetables first, then fruits, then, and, and that includes berries, right? Berries actually have a special place because they are so good at, you know, helping to prevent a lot of cancers and helping to improve your memory. Uh, starchy carbohydrates are next. Now you cannot survive off of vegetables and fruits alone. You will go so hungry. So you need a starch. You need to feel full. And I know a lot of you may be afraid of starches because it increases your insulin levels. But remember how we talked about if you can keep your fat down, then insulin can actually do its job more properly and be more effective. And it can actually improve your insulin sensitivity. So you don't need to be afraid of starch. You don't need to be afraid of potatoes, but you do need to be afraid of what you're putting on the potatoes. Are you putting ranch dressing on them? Are you putting butter on them? Are you putting, you know, like a sour cream? 
And, and now you should know why, why that matters. Because if you're putting the sour cream or the butter, well, that's going to be higher in the saturated fat, which is going to increase your risk of heart disease. But if you're just eating potatoes with a little bit of salt, um, but you're also, you know, potatoes are high in potassium. So that's also actually going to help reduce your risk of, 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 um, of high blood pressure. So we want to be eating these starchy carbohydrates to help us stay full um, and to help us stay satisfied. And, you know, in general, remember that, that there's four calories for every gram of fat, sorry, there's nine calories for every gram of fat and only four calories for every gram of carbohydrate. So it, you know, just a little bit of fat goes a long way as far as your overall calorie intake. So prioritize plant sources of fats. You still want to eat fat, but you want it to come from avocados, from nuts and from seeds. And for proper absorption of these vitamins and nutrients that are fat soluble, you do need a little bit, but how much fat do you actually need every day? And usually you can meet your goals and get everything your body needs with about 30 grams of fat a day. Um, and so, you know, liquid oils, even olive oil, it's incredibly calorie dense and it may not help you in your weight loss goals. So if you're eating a salad every day, you're getting your vegetables in, but if you're dousing it in, in olive oil, it's just going to improve. It's healthy. It's like, there's, there's a lot of things that it can help you with, but, um, it's going to prevent you from being able to lose weight. So we really want to keep the calorie content low naturally by avoiding oils as much as possible. And so we want to consume less candy and chips. <laughs> we want to consume less cheese, less pastries, pastries and cakes, less convenient foods, fast foods. Now, don't get me wrong. I still occasionally have candy. I still occasionally have cheese. I still occasionally have pastries, but it's very sparingly. So I don't want you to think that I'm telling you, you can never have these again, but it's very special occasions. It's special events. It's not part of your day to day, right? So oils, try to minimize those oils, try to minimize your dairy, try to minimize your, your meat intake. Mm. And even try to minimize how many nuts you're eating because that can prevent you from losing the weight that you want or other high fat condiments, even if they're vegan, um, minimize the amount of chocolate. I love chocolate. I hear you <laughs> minimize dried fruit because when you're eating too much, it's, dried fruit is actually very high calorie food and minimize the amount of alcohol and pizza or other packaged foods, including bars. So even like my Lara bars, which I like, if you're trying to lose weight, you're going to want to minimize these things refined flours, added sugars. Let's minimize all of that. I'm not telling you not to cut them out, but just minimize them. And I want you to be able to eat liberally as much as you want until you're satisfied as many vegetables, fruits, oats, potatoes, whole grains, beans, legumes, um, moderately eat some avocados, but really try to limit, limit everything else. Even if it's healthy things like nut butters, we're going to limit those things. Okay, we're going to limit chocolate, even if it's dark chocolate and somewhat good for you, right? We want to limit the amount of those foods that you're eating, even bread, even whole wheat bread. We want to limit that. You can still have whole grains, but just not the processed form of bread. Bread is very calorie dense. Okay, so again, eating plant based is going to improve your health no matter what. But we're looking at eating plant based for weight loss. And that's two different things. Eating just plant based in general, you could eat bread, you could eat, you know, some dark chocolate, you could eat some nut butters and nuts. But eating plant based in a way that's going to help you lose weight, you have to minimize those things because you're focusing on those less calorie dense foods. Okay. So I hope that that is clear and you can understand that. Now, most diet plans work regardless, because out of all of the diet plans that you follow, like whether it's keto, whether it's a paleo, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, even if it's just whole 30, um, it's going to help you lose weight. And let me tell you why, because the average American on the standard American diet right now, most of their calories are actually coming from refined grains. So any diet that even just going gluten-free, <laughs> any diet that's limiting the refined grains and the next, or even, even more than that, sorry, is the added fats and oils. And when you put the two together, half of the standard American diet, half of their calories are coming from processed foods because usually it's the refined grains with the added fat from a processed food. That is really what most Americans are consuming. So any diet that tells you to stop processed foods is going to help you lose weight period. So I want you to recognize that, um, that it's all going to help you, especially if you include the sugar. So sugar, added fat, grain products, like 
this is all processed foods. This is all processed foods. And that's why all these other diets that even if you're eating a lot of meat in the paleo diet or the keto diet, even if you're doing all that, you're going to improve your health because you've cut out these huge sections of foods that most of us are overeating. But I don't want you to just do that. I want you to really eat in a way that's going to reduce your risk of heart disease. It's also going to reduce your risk of cancer and help you just feel better. That's going to improve your gut microbiome to help you lose weight. And in order to do that, we need to increase the vegetables and fruits. Okay. And decrease the amount of dairy. Cause you can see that's the next big thing is dairy and decrease the amount of meat. And when you do that, you'll be able to make a huge difference on your diet. So again, the average American eats mostly oils, fats, meat, and dairy, and then grain products and sugar with just the tiny fruits and vegetables. <laughs> so as soon as we flip your plate, and if we can make your plate look like this, if every time you look down at your plate and it is half vegetables, ideally vegetables, but you can throw in some fruit in there too, and then half, um, you know, those starchy veggies with some proteins um, and protein from like legumes or even a minimal amount of animal protein if you needed to. But in general, I want you to mostly eat more beans because that's going to keep your calorie density lower. Uh, but if you just look down at your plate, if you plan your meals this way, this is why I don't give you a meal plan because I just want you to eat in a way that if you look down at your plate, this is what you're seeing. If you eat like this, if you continue to do this day in, day out, day in, day out, you will lose weight. But you have to have faith in yourself. You have to have faith in the process. You have to have faith in the driver, right? To continue going. Um, and you have to have faith in yourself. And it's going to take a little bit longer than if you were to do maybe like a high protein diet. Sometimes those can go fast. Um, but honestly, it can go fast too. And a lot of people in our program have seen that, especially during the emotional eating challenge. Now, you were designed, your, your body was naturally designed to eat, eat plants that most of what you should be consuming is plants. And that is naturally where, what you should have been eating. If you think about it 400 years ago, we didn't have the access to protein. Like we have now today, I can go to the grocery store. I can buy as much protein as I want. I could eat a high protein diet and that's it. And be totally fine. Back in the day, like you would kill a cow, but then the whole town would eat the cow. And then day in, day out, you're mostly eating plants right? You're eating plants. And we know that because we could follow the hunters and gatherers. So the Hazda, the Had, Hadza are one of the last remaining hunter gatherer societies on the planet. They hunt and kill some animals to eat. However, they also consume a hundred or more grams of fiber a day in their food. Now I told you, most of us aren't even getting to like 15 grams of fiber a day they are getting a hundred or more grams of fiber a day. During the year, they will eat over 600 different types of plants in their diet. That is what hunters and gatherers were eating. They were gathering even more than they were hunting. The average American gets a pathetic 15 grams, right? And 50 or fewer plant species in their diet. We were designed to eat way more plants than we're eating. And I know it's going to be hard for you to go from 15 grams of fiber to hundred. So I'm not telling you to go there overnight. I want you to slowly ease into it because if you go overboard, you're going to experience a lot of gas and bloating. It's going to be uncomfortable. Your gut needs to adjust. Just like if you were to go to the gym tomorrow and say, you were not one to wait, lift weights, you're going to the gym and lift weights and go as heavy as you possibly can. You're going to be wrecked. You're going to be so sore and so uncomfortable. You're going to hate it. And you never want to go back. That's how most people eat plant-based. It's like, I need to eat this way. And so they start eating and their gut is wrecked. Like they can't handle it. And that's why most people are like, your body just naturally can't handle it. Well, we were designed to be able to handle it, but we need to build up to that. Just like you need to build up to the strength when you're working out at the gym. And so if you can follow this method, this is actually the McDougal method for weight loss. And basically half of your plate is going to be vegetables and the other half is going to be non-starchy vegetables. This is the most simple way of doing it as possible, right? It's even more simple um, than the plate that I showed you before is really just keeping that half of your plate veggies, half of it starchy veggies, right? Those starchy foods, the potatoes, the beans, the rice, um, the other half is vegetables. So if you can even, I know I talked like about adding some fruit in here. And that will definitely get you to that moderate weight loss. We're adding in some fruit, but if you want to lose weight more rapidly then eating half vegetables, will get you there. 
and you can snack on fruit throughout the day, but I want you to look at your plate and make sure that half of that is vegetables. And that is key to losing weight as quickly as possible on a plant-based diet. And again, you may be thinking like, what? Potatoes? Potatoes are your friend. Don't be afraid of them. Be afraid of what you're putting on top of them, not potatoes themselves. Out of all the foods that were measured on the satiety index, right? They measured meat, they measured dairy, they measured all the things. And potatoes were actually found to be the most satiating. And you'll find that, especially if you do the emotional eating challenge, I do encourage you to eat a lot of potatoes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And once you start doing that, when you're eating that many potatoes, you will be shocked at how full you are on a very small amount of calories. That potatoes, you know, yeah, you'll have a potato for dinner. You may not experience the satiating power that potatoes have, but when you're eating mostly potatoes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're it's amazing how they will keep you full if you're eating enough. And if you're trying, if you say you do the emotional eating challenge and, and you're just having one little potato and one little, and you're still hungry, it's because you need to eat more. <laughs> Don't be afraid to eat more, eat more potatoes, snack on potatoes. I will put a potato in the microwave and then just grab it when I'm out and about at the park and eat that with some vegetables, right? So use, use the power of these satiating foods to help you stay fuller longer on less calories. Now, how do we know there's all this research, but but how do we know that this will work? How do we know that this is the best way to eat if you want to lose weight and live longer? And all you have to do is look at those who have lived the longest on the planet. What are these people eating? The healthiest people on the planet who are living to be 100 years old and older, who are living without disease, what are they eating? Well, that is a question that Dan Buhner set out with. He decided to, that he, he took a map of the, of the world and he took his blue pen and he looked at the data and circled areas and cities of the world where people who lived the longest without disease were living. And what he did is he traveled to all of these areas. So these areas were called blue zones. He studied them. What did they do? What did they eat? How did they live? And they all had things in common. They all had a strong community. They all, you know, were, <laughs> were, were supported by that community, but they also were all eating a whole plant food diet, like a whole food plant-based diet. They were eating potatoes in Okinawa, Japan, mostly potatoes and vegetables, right? In Loma Linda, California, mostly they're Adventists and they are following a vegan diet. Uh, you know, in Italy, you hear about the Mediterranean diet. That's why you hear about the Mediterranean diet um, because of, of this, right? They're, but their plant, their source of protein um, is not animal products. They did, some of these areas do eat meat sparingly, for a little bit of flavor to their dishes, but most of the time they're using beans for their protein source. Um, are they bodybuilders? No, none of these people are going to be have six pack abs, <laughs> but they are going to be living to be 100 years old and older um, without the diseases that we are seeing, without the cancer, the Alzheimer's, the heart disease. So I want to conclude that it's more important about what you're adding in than what you're taking away, right? That only one in 10 of us are eating enough fruits and vegetables. But if we ate mostly eight to 10 servings of mostly vegetables, that it could prevent 7.8 million deaths worldwide annually. <laughs> that that's how important it is to add in more vegetables. So that's where the foundation starts. Let's not stress about what we're taking away yet. I do want you to eventually, you know, reduce the cheese, reduce the meat. But in, in general, focus on adding in, look down at your plate is half of your plate vegetables, period, is half of it vegetables every time you go to eat. Start counting plants. Are you eating at least 30 different plants every week? And this includes whole grains, nuts, seeds, legumes, fruits, and vegetables, not just fruits and vegetables. This includes all of the whole grains, the nuts, the seeds. And if you're eating that variety, then you're going to experience a better microbiome, which will help you in your weight loss process. Now. I want you to write in the chat, what was your takeaway? What aspects of calorie density do you need to apply in your weight loss journey? What are you going to do tomorrow for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? <laughs> and I know the thought of having vegetables for breakfast does not sound great, but I promise you, even if you can grab a handful of carrots before, you, you, before your meal, that it will make a difference in your weight loss journey. So go ahead and write in the chat, what are you going to do tomorrow? What aspects are you going to apply in your life so that you, you weren't just here to learn, but you were here to make changes. So I want to hear what it is you are going to change. What are you going to change tomorrow? Start eating potatoes. Yes. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yes. And what vegetables, how can you add in more of those vegetables, right? 
Now, because <laughs> I don't even do this. Um, tomorrow, we are going to talk about the, the other things because it's one thing to know what to eat. It's another thing to know, like, that to get your mind in the right place. So you actually want to eat that. <laughs> um, I love that. Yeah, I will eat 10 vegetables and not snack on the chips and cookies. So good. So tomorrow, again, like I, I mentioned in the very beginning of the call, most of us knew all of this. Like what I said was is pretty easily available for if anyone wanted to Google it. I mean, I, I searched it right after my husband's stroke and found a lot of this information. Um, so I'm not teaching anything new. But the problem is, how do you actually make yourself want to eat vegetables? <laughs> how do you get yourself to, to want to change your diet, to want to do something differently? Because we're used to our old habit. We're used to doing it just the way that we're, where we're comfortable with. And the problem is a lot of us are here because you want to lose weight and you can't lose weight if you don't change. You have to change. But in order to change, you have to work on that inner identity. You have to be able to be willing to do that. And that all starts with your mind. So tomorrow we'll go deeper into the second part of the equation, and that is how to get your mind in the right spot so that you can do everything I just taught and what will set you up for success. And your homework for tonight, and if you haven't already written in the chat to tell me what you're going to do, um, make sure that you set a goal for tonight to eat that 50-50 plate. Right, where 50% is, is non-starchy and 50% is, so 50% is vegetables. And the other 50% is the starchy vegetables like the rice and beans or the potatoes that are actually going to help keep you full. Um, okay. And then start thinking about ways that you can regulate your emotions that don't involve food. Because tomorrow we're going to talk a lot about emotional eating. So tomorrow is where we dive deep into the emotional eating. Um, and we start thinking about what are the things that you can do instead of choosing food when you are wanting to treat or you're bored or you are sad or happy, you know, what are other, some, some things that you can do? So start thinking about that. Awesome. I'm excited to see you all tomorrow. Um, are there any questions? I want to stop, you know, give you, give you a chance to answer any questions while you're here. Feel free to write them in the chat. <laughs> actually eat breakfast. Some people, I will say, Donna, if you don't eat breakfast um, and you've never eaten breakfast, you don't have to eat breakfast. I, there have been some clients that they didn't eat breakfast before. And so they're like, I need to eat breakfast. And they started gaining weight. They weren't losing the weight they wanted. And so I was like, just, just keep doing what you were already doing. You don't need to add in more food necessarily. And then once they did that, then they were able to see the weight loss. So if, if you are not a breakfast person, I'm not telling you have to eat breakfast. Uh, but when you do eat your food, just make sure that you're eating the vegetables. Uh, eat 30 different plants a week. Love that. Start eating potatoes, more vegetables. I'll eat more carrots and peppers for snacks. Yes, I tend to eat fruit. Yeah, that's most of our go-tos. I bet all of us could eat five fruits a day. No big deal. And if that's all you can do, that's even better than nothing at all because fruit has so many good things. Fruit is not your enemy. Fruit is so good for you. Fruit will help you in your goals. Fruit has fiber. Fruit has uh, you know, those, those antioxidants inside of them, all those colors with all those nutrients, um, those, those polyphenols, like there's so many wonderful things about fruit. Um, but if you want to lose weight faster, you want to prioritize vegetables. Okay. I don't want you to have a fruit fear. Uh, don't fear fruit. Just don't just try to add in more vegetables instead of fruit. Do you cover adding veggies to a smoothie such as spinach? Some say no to smoothies. Um, okay. So that yeah, you can, you can, but in our emotional eating challenge, which is kind of what will help jump start the weight loss as again, phase two. So after these three days, I want you to be doing that. Um, I tell you not to do smoothies for those two weeks, but in general, yes, a smoothie can totally work. The reason why people say not doing smoothies is because it kind of like bread, when you take a whole grain and you grind it up and you put it into a bread, it becomes nutrient dense. Same thing with all these fruits and vegetables. When you take an apple and an orange and, you know, or, you know, spinach, all those things, and you grind it up and you put it in a smoothie, you may not have been able to eat all of that, but you could sip it really easily, which is fine if you want more nutrients, if you're really trying to pack in the nutrients, which is not great if you are trying to lose weight. So it's, it's kind of up to you if you feel like your smoothie may be, pre may be preventing your weight loss goals, then, then you can avoid it. But it's, if it isn't, then you'll be okay. If as long as you're eating half vegetables, you know, for lunch and dinner and you're seeing progress, then continue with the smoothie and that's fine. Um, but for the emotional eating challenge, I do have you follow a specific plan and smoothies 
I mean, I tell you not to necessarily do it, even though I would have like a smoothie as a treat with spinach and, and things. So it's, it kind of go with your, your gut. Okay, adding vegetables to my my oat groats and still cuts along with some fruit. Vegetables are going to be the most difficult for all three meals, but I can do it. Yeah, so for breakfast, I add ri frozen rice cauliflower to my oatmeal or to my, you know, with my potato. Frozen rice cauliflower because it's pretty tasteless. You can add a little bit of, you know, vanilla um, to mask the flavor. You can add a little bit of cocoa powder. You can do a lot of things to kind of mask the flavor. Uh, but if you took your regular oatmeal, um, but instead of having all the oatmeal, if you did half oatmeal and half of the frozen rice cauliflower, then you've, you've lost like a hundred calories, but you're going to be just as full. That makes sense. I would love to share this with my family. Do you some of the content in your YouTube videos? Um, I may, uh, I may, I'll keep you in touch with that right now. No, but I may, um, I may put this up on YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube, you'll know that I decided to, <laughs> um, it, it would be in a life. It would be in a life. Okay. Please explain again, the schedule for this group. I missed the beginning. So the, the plan is, so for those of you, oh, I want to actually include this. If you, for any reason, if you're here and you did not join the actual membership, then that's the link for my incredibly amazing deal to join the membership. It's ridiculously cheap, um, especially for what you get. So you, you're most of you have joined the membership already. Since you have, um, then this first three days is the weight loss challenge. Okay, and then the next step, or depending on your schedule, when you can kind of you know put it in, the next step is going to be the two week emotional eating challenge. Now, what that is, is you, that's where, so to these three days, you just sit and you learn, right? We kind of set goals. I want you to try out the 50, 50 play. I want you to kind of experiment with some things, but you're really just sitting and learning to understand the concept. Then when you start the emotional eating challenge, you are actually putting it into practice in a very specific meal plan. And you're listening to videos every single day for two weeks, because we tackle that thinking part, which we'll talk about tomorrow. We tackle all the doubts so you can keep going with faith. And we also tackle the actions. And then the third step, if, and that will be if you stay longer than a month, if you continue in the membership, the third step will be the healthy eating challenge where you can, you don't have to follow a very specific meal plan. You can be a lot more flexible, but then you're learning how, you know, to put everything into practice in an act, in your actual lifestyle without, you know, being overly restrictive. So there's three phases. So phase one is all education. Phase two is education and uh, putting it into practice. And phase three is just practice. So those are the phases and you can be in those phases, you know, for as long as you want. Um, and you can, you can always go back to the emotional eating challenge, things like that. So that's kind of what, where I want you to be. Um, I'll show you at the beginning of the call again tomorrow, what those, um, what those challenges are. If you haven't already seen them when you log in into the membership. Okay. Can you use almond milk and soy unsweetened at all? Yes. Yep. hundred percent. I use soy milk every day. And I use it sweetened <laughs> um, because honestly, that's how I can eat. So my breakfast is lately, it, you know, after I did the emotional eating challenge, I actually fell in love with potatoes so much that now my breakfast, it used to be oatmeal. Now I have a sweet, like half of a sweet potato, frozen rice cauliflower um, with some soy milk and some frozen blueberries. Um, and you can do like some cocoa powder or even like a chocolate protein powder, whatever it is to add a little flavor you want. I know it sounds bizarre, but it's so good. It's like a frozen dessert for breakfast. Um, okay. I have tried the 50 way of eating, but I need dressings. It gets so dry. Yes. Yes. So any dressings works just fine. Like ketchup, um, low, lower in sugar, lower in fat dressings. I'll do, um, if you have my fall meal guide, I have a tofu Alfredo sauce that is really good. Like I can put that on top of potatoes all day, all along. Um, and it's lower in calories, lower in fat. That one's really good. So yeah, there's, you do need the dressings. I have, um, on my YouTube videos, Google plant wise, YouTube, I have my top 10 dressings, uh, they're oil free. So that gives you 10 different variations. The sweet ones sometimes are nice when you're really wanting something sweet, but you're not eating sweets. Uh, so like when I was doing it, I would dip some of my vegetables in like the sweet dressings. Um, so yeah, that should give you some ideas. There's 10 of them there. So make sure you watch that YouTube video. Cool. Any other questions before we end the night? 
Thank you for sticking around. Most of you stuck around to the end. I'm so impressed. So again, I will see you tomorrow. Most people stay for today and they're like, they, you think that you have everything you need and you don't show up tomorrow. Now I understand if your schedule gets in the way, but please do everything you can to come tomorrow because it really is the key um, to, to overcome that emotional eating. The key is to, to overcome all the other stuff that prevents you from doing what you know you need to do. And so do not skip tomorrow. It is key. And for everyone who comes tomorrow and stays until the very end, I have a special meal guide for you um, if you stay until the end. So you don't want to miss it. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thank you for joining. And I will see you tomorrow. Going to eat fruits. Yay. <laughs> All right. You guys have a good night.